Okay. We were livestock use shoots. Um, you know, you can stand your technique for holding them. But when you're working with zoos, you do a lot of varieties. You, you're constantly challenged and finding ways to manage animals. When we talk about animal restraint, people think about guarding animals. We'll talk about that. Most of our stuff is done, you know, we do as much as possible without them, we physically, chemically restrain animals. So you can physically restrain a lot of things. What's the problem with physically restraining the zoo animals? What happened then? Just the amount of animals. Now, most of animals are people acclimated, but they're not tame. They're not domestic animals, they're not pets. We're used to having people around. In most cases, you can restrain them for a little while. But we need to just put it in a crate, give it a shot, or do a quick blood collection while we restrain animals. If it is anything more extensive, or if it's a high stress animal, we're going to do some of the kids in the This is a rattlesnake. I'm just saying we don't have to pick up a rattlesnake. We take advantage of the behavior. This is called 2B. You should put it, snakes like to crawl in little holes. So you put the snake on the floor, but the human there is going to crawl in. So you wait for it to go in far enough that its head isn't there, and then you can restrain it this way to do procedures. So as long as the head's in there, you can work with this half of the snake safe. If you want to anesthetize it, just put the anesthetic machine on the other end and wait for it to fall asleep. This is, if you work livestock, this is a modified chute. Um, these are common in managing livestock. The same business has modified them a little bit. There's two different things. One is called a drop force chute. It's used in the deer industry quite a bit. Animals walk into the chutes and then it's sort of lead and the bottom drops off so the feet are dangling and they often just sit there rather complacently if their feet can't touch anything. And this is called the hugger. It's a hydraulic padded chute. This works really well for us to have stick, uh, foam padding, uh, and the animal goes in there and hydraulically presses them. Now it's not, it's not crushing them, but because it feels this pressure all around its body, it can't really move, it can't turn. It can shut those feet, but it can't hit or do anything like that. What type of shoot do you use on giraffes? Uh, the, for giraffes, we do put them in a alleyway, which is slightly wider than them. And we don't, we don't, um, we close them in, but we don't put any kind of physical pressure on them. So they'll walk down the alley, you close the fucking back door. You do this regularly, when you're not doing things, you close the fucking back door, you just open the back and off they go. Our shoot has a skill in the bottom, so you can when they do that. And then if you need to do a procedure, they're already in the shoot. Used to be in the shoot, you can do things like call, the blood, get the injection. And then ours aren't yet, but they will be trained to allow foot work. Most of that have the grass are trained to put the feet on the block, lift the foot up, or hook the tree, trained to do things like that. There's a great big version of this that works for elephants. Elephants are the biggest, one of the easiest animals to work because they're so human oriented, they have a lot of conditioned behaviors where they'll first have to really kill them. They have to cut, they have to foot. Lay down, uh, kneel down, uh, present her ear for blood pressure, all sorts of things. There is a device like this that we need to physically restrain them right now. And that, and that elephant, she tips over. So you put an elephant in, you close it, and you can take the motor on your side. And they lay there perfectly content. So you can work on their feet, lift them back up, and turn them out. We do talk about darting things. People always think about darting animals from helicopters and shooting animals with dart guns and anesthetizing them like it's in TV. Uh, we do, we dart things every day. But anesthesia is probably a quarter of the of the things we dart. So we dart with vaccines, we dart with antibiotics, we dart with hormones, we dart with vitamins, anything we need to give by injection. The animals have a flight distance, right? You have to that grab in your yard, you can walk up a certain distance, it doesn't move, and then you get a little closer, it runs off. It's a flight distance. Do so animals have the same thing? Is in a zebra in a stall, in a corral, it's used to people being outside the fence. They're not going to react to people outside the fence. I can walk up to the corral and shoot it with a dart gun, throw it sticks in, that looks like that, sticks in, gives an injection, falls out, the zebra jumps, it spins around, can't figure out what it was, goes back to doing whatever it was doing. Um, so we can give an animal an injection every day for a week without having to physically get our hands on it, but without stressing animals. This is a wonderful, complex, very expensive dart gun that we hardly ever use. This we would use for animal escapes or you know, wildlife or something on the ground. We just don't need this in the zoo because all our animals are in confined areas. We can get relatively close to anything in the zoo. From here to that wall would be a far shot in the zoo. Um, because animals used to be in around and are in some level of containment, we don't really use the dart gun too much.
So do you use a rifle for capture? This is one of the industrial products, I'll talk about later. But here's Dr. Barry um, with the antibiotics, it's kangaroo. This kangaroo has an infection. You could catch it every day, it'd be difficult. Uh, it could be dangerous for the animal and for the person, but you walk into the exhibit and use the blow gun, shoot it with the dart, and stick it right there in the butt. Then it will jump around. The dart takes about three seconds to eject. The dart usually stays in for a minute. As they jump around, it falls out. And these darts are theoretically reusable. Often animals will jump up and down on them or bite them and chew them. And just throw them but if you retrieve them, you can sterilize them and reuse them. That sort of technology has made our job much more, uh, more simple. But again, physical restraint. You know, let's think of physical restraint. This is a stingray getting in the exam. You have to clip the barbs on the stingray tail. You don't want to end up like Steve Irwin with a ball of chest. Uh, but you can just scoop them out. You know, they're fish, they're, they're air, they're water, and you need to be water, but they can stay out for a minute or two, just like you can jump in the pool for underwater for a minute, uh, maybe not a minute. You can scoop them out. People know what to do. They're restrained. Get the exam, put the barb, put them back in. Uh, all done with physical restraint. We deal with a lot of specialists, so zoos are sort of, zoo veterinarian, veterinarians are generalists, zoo veterinarians are sort of the ultimate generalists, we know a little bit about a lot of stuff. Uh, we're happy to call in experts, and that's a fun thing about working with zoo animals is used for all kinds of experts. Dr. Sanchi is a surgeon, was at OSU until this recently, he finds surgeons, she's happy with lots of cases. This is a, there's a lot of horse. So a wild horse and a domestic horse are pretty much the same thing. The difference is what you can do with it. So if it's a domestic horse, then you have to we're walking it and treating it and flushing the wounds. We can't do that with this horse, but, but the surgical, the surgical approach is the same. She tells us what works surgically, we tell her what works for management. Uh, Dr. Webb is a veterinary ophthalmologist. She works at MedVet, which is a, a multi-person special practice in northern Ohio, northern Columbus. Uh, doing an ophthalmic exam on a tiger, a tiger with retinal degeneration. Dr. Webb examines her every six months. Uh, Dr. Donovan is a physician. He's an anesthesiologist at Riverside Hospital. He comes out and helps us with all of our grade 8 anesthesias because a grade 8 is just like a great big, really ugly person. Uh, the drugs are the same, the anesthetics are the same, the man management is the same. So we have a gorilla procedure called Joe. He comes out and does anesthesia for us. That's what's focus on the um, medicine. And this was a baby delivered five years ago by Dr. Donovan and some of these uh, Here's a, de a dentist, a DDS, a human dentist. All humans, but dentists are worse than humans. Uh, doing root canal on a bear. We're talking about dental care. You, know, you could just pull this tooth, but this bear's going to live another 10 years, so we can do root canal and maintain the tooth, and it's going to be healthy in the long run. And a lot of calling specialists because they, the first thing they do is they panic. I don't know anything about whatever it is. But you can convince them, you know, okay, you're a pediatrician, you know children, I'm a veterinarian, and I know gorillas. So between us, we can figure out what to do with this baby gorilla. But once you get them thinking outside the box, so you're really excited about it. There's so many veterinary specialists now that we use fewer MDs. It used to be if we need anything specialized, we'd use MDs. And now they're you know, outstanding veterinary ophthalmologists and dermatologists and radiologists and surgeons at OSU and at MedVet that we use them. Cardiologists we use a lot. We use them a lot. So here's a case of the other specialist. This is Anam, Kamoka Dragon, came from Hawaii. And Anam is about 30 something, she lived to be close to 50, so he's adult, not old. He came to breed with Audrey, a female. Um, or Audrey male had died. And Anam had been here a few months and we noticed he had an abnormal, uh, abnormal gait. His left front leg, you can see there, had developed arthritis in the joint, so when he would walk, he would drag his leg behind him. He would drag it and he would put it forward. And he would drag it and put it forward. The problem, he was getting around, okay, the problem was doing that he's going to cause damage to his foot. He's going to wear down his nails, he's going to break his foot, and it could be secondary. So we contacted a company that makes prostheses. Uh, I forget the name of the company. We're in Dublin. They build you know, prosthetic arms and legs and all sorts of things for people. Same sort of thing. I said, I have a Komodo dragon. He had no idea where to start. So we can listen. Just come out and take a look. And this is a sort of splint that they make um, for people to, to immobilize the joint. So we, you know, talking to him, here, well, here's what we know, here's what you know, is doing, here's what we want him to do. All we just need to do is keep the foot from holding over. So we designed a splint, we sedated it, and we made a cast, made a splint, came out and put it on, it wasn't right, right, came out several times and put it back on, um, until it fit perfectly. It's come on with velcro, it doesn't seem to care at all that it's on there. It keeps it a little bit, so when you move forward, it moves like this, it's like this. So 
work for two months and his arthritis resolved and he walks quickly to normal. Challenging animals, challenging situation. The other thing to do as a zoo veterinarian, sometimes in pet in practice too, is visit pathologists. And we have the advantage of having an OSU here, so we can ship things that die down to the diagnostic lab and get an expert with all this. But in most zoos, the veterinarian is going to do the autopsy and post form exam. And you learn so much from that. You learn you know, normal anatomy and what things look like and where things are. Most of it's where you expect it to be, but you deal with things like anteaters and koalas and unusual species. You're always learning about you know, what's normal and how big should this be and, and, and you know, what's, what's supposed to be there and what's not supposed to be there. Some of, it, some of it is revealing, some of it is challenging, some of it really helps you figure out what to do the next time. This is a sheep, it's a domestic sheep in our, in our farmyard. It was circling to the left, walking in circles. It eventually died. This is a gigantic abscess in its brain. It's in half of this quarter, it's a quarter of the half of this size is an abscess. This goat was normal except it was walking in circles. It had a bacterial infection in its brain. This is looking inside the chest, and you guys probably have any pathology, but this is a lung floating in a pool of water. You probably know that that's not right. Not true water, it's serum. So this animal has severe pleuritis, an infection in the chest, and it's causing so much that she did, it's collapsing the lung. So by looking at this, now I know what the pathology was that caused the clinical signs of that animal. So next time I see an animal doing that thing, I may think about it. So this is a bird. If you had a different kind of anatomy, you won't get much bird anatomy. Um, you get some poultry. This is the, so the, the chest is open, the rib cage is off, the head is liver, and this is the heart. Actually, this is the heart. This is a big fluid, fluid sac around the heart. That's the pericardium. So the pericardium is the connective tissue that surrounds the heart. Should not be any fluid inside it, it should just be adjacent to the heart. And in certain, certain kinds of infection, you get injured bird in the zoo. So we know that this animal is just acting large. It didn't seem to have any energy, which could be a hundred things. The bird, the one thing we hadn't thought about was the heart. We had died into the autopsy and realized what the cause was. Um, I mentioned that we don't import things very often. We do occasionally. This, and, we, and when we deal with primates, the uh, regulations are much more rigid. We've been hearing about it all right? Um, there are a lot of viral diseases that primates get that people could theoretically. In most cases, it's theoretical. There may be a case or two that happen. The regulatory agencies are they protect people, so they often will instill or initiate a lot of rules uh, that involve animals that are polluting the So the CDC regulates primate imports. They have to bring animals in. We have to do this complete isolation, Ebola type outfit. They have to bring primates in from outside the country. And that means that from Canada or from England or France, these aren't wild born primates. We have to bring outside the country. So as a zoo veterinarian, you have to work on all the regulations, all the potential diseases, all the real diseases, and all, you know, all the possible concerns. Anytime we do animal shipments, there's a whole series of regulations we have to follow. Some of them are livestock industry, some of them related to pet diseases, a lot of them are related to human diseases. I'll talk a little bit about enrichment and kind of what condition, not what conditioning for this. Now, in the wild, animals spend a lot of time looking for food, avoiding predators, and looking for mates. When you move into the zoo, it's like being in a resort hotel, and all they're asked to do is produce offspring. So, a lot of things they normally do with their day is they're taken care of by the keepers. So, animals get bored, so people. And when they get bored, they get vices. So, keepers spend a lot of time enriching the animals' environment. You know, a proper enrichment should be a, a complex environment, a little bit social system, and then Often variation in their diet. And that just doesn't mean what they eat, but how they eat it. For example, tigers normally hunt, they are good climbers, so they put the tiger's food in a burlap bag hanging in a tree. Or they just put it in a bowl in front of them, these tigers have got to work first down. This, this is a dog food and meat, it's like ground beef, that they normally eat. They put it in a big bucket and froze it. So that's the only person who's been all day trying to get this frozen food out of this bucket. So it will fill up his day with some activity. No one believes that this lion thinks this is a zebra, but this is as enriching for the keepers in this again. They're sweet. So they make a um, paper mache zebra and put meat in it, put out in the yard of this lion, so the half hour walking around around the zebra trying to figure out what the heck it was. Knew it smelled like meat and finally attacked it and tore it up with the So this animal's day was full of a more normal activity than normal. 
And I'm talking about operant conditioning. This is called target training. This otter learns when it touches his nose to this red stick, and gets a treat. So that's, that's capturing the behavior. You do it until it's out of neck. And you don't have to give a reward at all. You have to give it to him occasionally, but not every time. So now, the way you put this stick, you leave that out of the ocean. You put it in the crate, it goes in the crate. You put it on the scale, it goes on the scale. If you have three others, you can put them in three different places. If you want to treat one or ten more or something like that. So, um, you train a very basic behavior, and then you can hold the stick out, and the others can be curious as to go on the stick. And then he gets a reward, and they learn really quickly. So, by this uh, shaping these behaviors into what you want them to do, you can really, uh, enrich them, you can get keepers out easier, and send them to the veterinarians. So, I'm going to look at this otter's mouth, he's trying to come over here to this target. He's going to stand up and open his mouth, trying to bite the stick, and I can look at his mouth. I think we train to put a lot of parents and put one hand up or one the other hand up or the feet up. They'll lean in and then you grab their ears and their chest up so you can sculpt them. So it really makes our job better. It helps the keepers manage the animals. If you handle something, you can do it. We don't have a lot of neonatal care because of oh why? I mean, I mean, I'm trying to pull it to the animals. They, you know, you want them to be, to be well handled. If you raise them in human care, they know they socialize with humans. And it's worse with primates than other animals. Carnivores are kind of the middle of the stock, don't make that same association. But we try to raise them in natural environments. Often hand raised animals that don't recognize their species or don't reproduce well, or if they do reproduce well, they don't raise babies because they've never raised them. They don't, they've never been around the babies. So we often will try to keep them in the, we do try to keep them in the natural environment, but often we need to pull them from medical care. Uh, often work on neonates, and neonates are I think, really important because they're often in a really bad condition and they really respond to each other. They're one of the most resilient life stages. If they're cold or not, or dehydrated or hypoglycemic, or cold blood sugar, they respond to each other well. So we may put a nice view for a day or two and then get back to the lawn. This little guy with this leg, once we've got a caps on, we've got to used to it, we've got to come on um, and get the nursery. What's the problem with pulling in the nursery baby from mom? No, try that. We take our baby out very long, and mom will quit producing milk, so we want to keep the mom as short as possible. And then training. Most zoos, or many zoos, are involved in, in active training programs, training veterinarians, training keepers, training vet cats. And even the ones that don't have a structured program that have you know, volunteers and internships, internships, and things like that for training. Um, their zoo medicine is recognized specially. There's American College of Zoological Medicine. After you complete a residency, publish five papers, and take a two-day long grueling exam, you get to be a diplomate in American College of Zoological Medicine. That's a recognized specialty that says you know, there's a known body of knowledge and experts in this field. So there's a college of surgery and ophthalmology and rheumatology. There are now about 116 veterinarians in the College of Zoological Medicine. So these people are all training in their residencies to qualify to take the exam. Um, I think I clapped up here to speed up a little bit here. Um, we have this a little bit more to talk about. Uh, I've got this captive management plan here because we talked about the variety of things that we do. All these different species have captive management plans. Well, the species survival plans are attached on advisory groups. So these are consortiums of <coughs> in the country that work on the species as a group. So we have eight cheetahs that come to the zoo, but all cheetahs in North America are managed as one population. So we look at the genetics, we look at the diversity, we look at the compatibility, we move animals around to maintain their genetic diversity. Tigers are a good example. Tigers are very prolific in captivity. Our pair has had six cubs, a litter of two, then a litter of four. We don't need to read those two anymore. They're, they're well represented, so we'll send our females somewhere else, which we can bring them a different help maintain genetic diversity. All these communities have veterinary advisors. They want to know what kind of diseases are we worried about, what are the prior drugs, what are the causes of death, what's the best diet, things like that. So it's just another way that you get to use the veterinary knowledge in a, a non specific clinical focus. All right, we're going to finish up the conservation estimates. That's sort of the big buzz, buzzword in the medicine. There are two definitions. The first one is very thorough, and the second one is succinct ecological context of health. When we talk about endangered species, the problems are similar. Uh, habitat loss, um, climate change, human erosion, things like that, encroachment, sorry, things like that. Uh, a normal healthy population, diseases from or be die offs or be immigration, uh, migration, genetic mixing, and populations go on. So disease and wild population is normal. But when you get small isolated populations, 
disease becomes significant. For instance, the blood fed bear population in North America dropped to a very low level and then came out of its temper with the population and reduced it to about 20 animals, nearly extinct because of the disease. So when populations get small, disease is getting important. You know, the veterinarians have that. And so there are a lot of veterinarians working in specifically conservation. And that's a really exciting field for those of you who are working in the zoo because you're taking what you learn in the zoo and applying it in a big world scenario. Most discussions have these sort of variation of the concentric cir circles. You have uh, environment, wild or animals, and humans. They all mesh and overlap in the synergist conservation. That's something called One Health. One Health is more of a human focus, but where changes in environment and human health and animal health are all they are no longer considered separate issues. Disease ecology, we're looking at diseases as an ecological system. We have multiple uh, Organism of all, you have a host, and you have a vector, and you have an agent, and you have environmental factors. It's not just treat this bug with this drug and you'll get a cure. This is West Nile. You can see that it's all about what season you're in, what vector you have, what host you have. You can't just say, we're going to treat this bird or get rid of the disease. So it's a whole different perspective on disease that we need as an ecological system. Uh, another important thing we do, especially working in developing countries, is capacity building. You've heard the adage, you have an fish and feed per day, teach them to fish and feed them alive. It's really cool to go to Madagascar and work on lemurs. Well, it's way more important to me to go to Madagascar and teach their vet to work on lemurs. So I've been going for 15 years, and every time we go, we go to the vet school, that's the vet school, I'm quite a close here, and we take a student or two in the field with us and teach us what we do with lemurs so in the future when they graduate, they can do that, and many of them are doing that now. But those kind of field projects aren't just in developing countries. This is the health in project in, in Ohio. The health in Eastern Health Energy used to be all up and down the Eastern Health United States, Mississippi, and River East, and now it's disappearing in many places because of ecological change. This is Dr. Wolf, director of conservation, created a totally new plant in the health in The little micro radio transmitter goes to happen in it, and this animal will find all those students. Uh, this is uh, part of the conservation department searching for health energy from the stream. So we know where they've been, we go and look and try to find where they are. If there are populations, we'll sometimes capture some animals, we'll transfer them in, um, so we can monitor them. That's just right here in Southern Ohio, we have to go back to the field conservation. A couple, a couple of words on my project, and then I'll let you go or answer questions. Presenting by a medical survey project is something that's worked on my past for 20 years. I mentioned getting involved in lemur projects. And what we discovered is that we were getting good with lemurs in captivity, and this is true of lots of species, but no one was studying lemurs in the wild. So these guys, these, People are also veterinarians, except for this young man, he is not. Um, that work with lemurs in the United States and set up a project where zoo veterinarians were available to go to Madagascar to work on field problems. So, in the field, we often have biologists or students and capturing animals from radio calls or relocations or genetic centers or something like that. Instead of a program where we would provide veterinarians free of charge to go with these people when they did their field captures, the system with good anesthesia and an exam and clarify. Medical samples do health assessments. So, this started in 2000 with a couple of projects. We've now been over 20 times and we have over 800 animals in our database. So, all these people, the reason this project works is we all do the same thing. We all go and do the same exam, we take the same samples, and run the same test, so it all goes into a database. So, then you have useful comparable data. So, now we're generating really good normal values and disease trends and susceptibilities of lemurs in areas all over Madagascar. And that's because Cooperative people who are willing to travel um, and cooperative people from the are willing to have a very different project. So, this is the kind of field project that, you know, if, you, if you're willing and, and develop some expertise and we're to a place that's accepting, and most of us are, we're going to be involved to get opportunities on that. Just saying. <laughs> All right, that's the end. We're a little bit over time. I'm going to give you a question. Six times, she said, No, I can't, but I have friends who can come. And then 
field for a while now, and you say, I've got to explain to you how to do it. And trying to get your hands to work in the national park, and so I'm trying to try to manage it. It's not right, and it's not easy to get access to the animals, and I knew it had to do their part, and then draw a project at the same time. I said the biggest risk is anesthesia, so this animal is being justified as a radar collar, it's still completely difficult to manage. So Dr. Blood and these things are very sexy, and you put those on the animals, and it's just kind of common. Thank you. 